911, what's your emergency? 911, what's your emergency? Be advised, car 4 has control of the pursuit. Seed with caution. Hello, everyone. How are you all doing this evening? Welcome to Behind the Crime Door. I'm Kristen. Welcome to all of my new subscribers and anyone who is watching my video on um, live stream on the replay. I so appreciate all of you. Please make sure that you hit the like button. Um, and subscribe so that you know when I go live next. Hey, Verbal. How are you, my dear? Good to have you here. Hey, Danger Dave. How are you? So good to see you. How are you, my friend? Hello, help me, Rhonda. Yvette Loshaw. Total Jag 1. Hey, Melissa. How are you? Hey, Triple S. Hi, Sierra. How are you? It's good to see you guys. Tonight we're going to talk about Idaho. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about Delphi because there was a, um, <clears throat> a court. Um, oh, what am I trying to say? <laughs> There was a thing that was posted um, to my case today uh, from the prosecution, and hold on one second, guys. My computer is not working. Eh. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and it's a petition to... To the court. So we're going to talk about that. Hey, Babs Forever. How are you? Thank you so much. I appreciate that. It's been a crazy, crazy few days. But it is good to see everyone here.
Hey, Josh, the posh, how are you? So good to see you, my dear. Thank you so much for being here. Hey, Maria, how are you, my dear? Hugs, hugs. Hey, Tech Death, how are you? Hey, we are Bristol City Football Club. How are you? Thank you so much for being here. Oh, I hear you, Josh. <laughs> I hear you on that. I'm cold. Um, I am. I have been ice bone chilled cold all day long. It has. It is extremely cold here, and I am cold. <laughs> so. But um, anyway, I am hanging in there and looking forward to um, the live stream tonight about Idaho and the crime flow. Hey, Gonzo. How are you, sweetie? So good to see you. Thank you for jumping in and saying hello. I know it's a hell of a lot colder where you are than where it is, where I'm at. <laughs> so what have you guys been up to? Oh, Melissa, you're lucky. <laughs> You're lucky. I don't know. What is, I don't even know what the temperature is right now. It's um, so cold. Um, I have my um, fireplace going in here. So hold on a second. Um, oh, weather. Here we go. Yeah, right now it's eight degrees. Um, feels like negative 16 outside um, and it's supposed to get really cold tonight so we are supposed to get blasted with more snow but hey we're getting that one day closer to um, um, spring right <laughs> Hey, Lynn, how are you? Good to see you. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here, Gonzo. You know that. I love it when you're here. <clears throat> you guys, he's out there where it's really cold, like 39 below zero cold. We do need it. I'm anxious for March Madness. I'll be happy with that. I'm anxious for it. It's coming. It'll be here in just a few weeks. I love it. Yep. Yeah, very much too cold. But he loves it. I think he thrives in it. It's that warm heart of his. It's what it is, you guys. <clears throat> so I had stopped in before I came here to uh, True Crime Web and Steve's Live. And it was really good, you guys. Um, I suggest that you go watch it. Um, because if you weren't in there before, because, um, the way he covers cases is just, I just really, I mean, you know, ex law enforcement, what's not to love. Right. But he, he's just so down to earth and what a, what a great guy he is. And Mrs. Steve is recovering from surgery. Um, and so she's having, <clears throat> um, 
you know, herself all bandaged up her hand. She had surgery on her hand and she's still sitting there beside him, helping out and um, doing the good deeds. So yeah, you know, we got to support those guys that are the real deal, Gonzo, and you know it, <laughs> you know, he's one, he's one of the good ones. You are so right. He is one of the good ones. And, you know, we, as we go through this genre that we're in of true crime, you know, there's, there's so many different um, styles that people cover cases with. Hey, JDR, how are you? And um, it's so good to see you. <laughs> um. You just have to find your, your, your person, the person that, that you feel comfortable with um, giving you or sharing um, these cases. And there's just a handful for me. And um, there's, I know there's more, I just don't have the time, but these are the ones that I support and the ones that I feel are doing a bang up job. It's not about subscribers. It's not about um, views. It's about coming on here and being factual and, and getting down to it with these cases and covering them with integrity. Hey, Paris, how are you? I haven't seen you for a while. It's very good to see you. <clears throat> and that's, that's the, that's the truth. Um, JDR, he is an educator and he does it in a very kind and um, down to earth manner. And, and I, and I think um, verbal judo is right. He loves it. You know, he loves to teach others and share his knowledge. And that is so awesome. So I was going to get rid of that screen. Hold on one second, guys. I just need to close out of some things here. So, um, I don't want to have too much opened and then have, uh, have something go wrong here. So I'm just trying to get everything in order so that I can go on here. Um, so, you know, guys, it's been, um, oh, Paris, I'm sorry. I'm glad that you're feeling better, my dear. <laughs> so we're going to talk about um, Idaho. And tonight, which is something, um, tonight I'm going to do something that I don't always do with these cases. But I've been thinking about some stuff and I actually came up with kind of a crime flow that I think may have happened. And I have a theory about what may have happened in this case. And I thought I might share it with you guys and see what you guys thought, what your thoughts are on it. Um, and what happened that night when Brian entered that house. And again, assuming that Brian is the killer, he is definitely innocent until proven guilty. But if he is the suspect and the person who um, committed the murders, we're going to go on that assumption with this theory. I think that I'm going to start it out with first, just, you know, Brian has these eyes that I don't know if they just happen to catch him in a really wrong, unflattering way. I hate pictures of myself. So I know that, you know, some people just don't take good photographs. I'm one of them. But <laughs> he has these eyes that you guys, I hate to say it, but they're like eyes of a killer in my opinion. They just look 
dead. <laughs> They're dark and just crazy. Um, I know it's been two months now since the gruesome murders of the four students at the University of Idaho. And I know that as we move away sometimes from cases, other cases happen. And, you know, we still follow them. We have an arrest now in this case. So nobody's covering it with the vim and vigor that they were two months ago. But there's still things that we can talk about with this case. And, you know, we've talked about it on this channel, basically comparing it to Delphi and how the two cases are eerily similar and how, you know, in some ways and how they were very small towns and, the difference in how the cases were were investigated and solved. Many people, and I, I'm I would I would venture to guess that the majority of people out there were baffled when they woke up to the news that these four um, college students had been brutally stabbed to death in their in their apartment. It just those are the kinds of stories that we just don't hear about. And it was, I think it sent shockwaves through the community, not only in Idaho, but in nearby Pullman, Washington, where the Washington State University is, which is only just a few miles from Moscow, Idaho. And I also think that, um, you know, they, they started immediately asking for the public's help. They started getting leads. Um, tips were, you know, flowing. And there, and there we go. So suppose you guys wanted to kill someone. Would that be easy? There's a lot of ways to do it. Would you choose a knife? It's pretty personal. You have to get really close to that person. But suppose you ended up killing or wanted to kill four people. And they all lived in the same location all within moments of each other. Would you choose to use a knife? <clears throat> I mean, I suppose it would eliminate the noise. But you know what? It's going to require skill. It's going to require strength. And it's going to require endurance. Murder is hard work, and especially if your victims fight back. Then there's this really big obstacle. You really want to get away with it. And you're determined to stab these four people living in a single home, in the middle of the night and you're going to disappear without leaving a clue to who you are. Is that a more difficult challenge? But guess what? You did it. You've got everybody stumped. It seems like the perfect crime. Right? Well, that's really what happened in Moscow, Idaho. And it's a beautiful little town um, that is just absolutely gorgeous if you ever get a chance to visit.
So Moscow is not pronounced Moscow, by the way, guys. It's Moscow. It rhymes with Costco. It is not pronounced like the Russian capital. And locals will quickly reman rem reprimand you if you um, pronounce it incorrectly. So it's Moscow, just so you know. Um, it was a football Saturday in mid-November. It was the last home game of 2022 for the University of Idaho. Um, they're known as the Vandals. And the Kibbe Dome had packed more than 7,600 fans that weekend. And despite their loss on that Saturday night, it was a college town, you guys. And there was partying. They were celebrating. And there are polls that state that the, Univ the University of Idaho is the best party school in their state. So it was a night to celebrate. There are a lot of frats, um, and they're known as wet frats um, on the University of Idaho campus. And they twist along Nez Pierce Drive. And these were crowded with brothers and their dates. Um, there were high-spirited assemblies fueled by loud music uh, the prospect of mischief that night, and rivers of alcohol. Um, the Hellenic Council, for reasons I don't have a, any idea on here, but does exist, prohibits liquor to be served in sororities, just so you know. Downtown Main Street was hopping. Um, it had the, you know, the pool tables at Mingles, um, the metal uh, sheath bar at the corner club was shoulder to shoulder with students and townies filling that brisk autumn night with the keen, cheery, rowdy late night fun. And they were all having a ball, as college kids will do. Then in that heavy, quiet snow of Sunday morning, four young people were going to be found brutally murdered. All were students. All were friends. And they were hacked to death in their beds while they slept. In this tiny little house that most of us were thinking it was bizarre how it was cut up inside <clears throat> and turned into an apartment for college kids. It's more just a little bit more than a stone's throw away from the college, um, from the heart of the campus. And there was so much blood that it had seeped through the wooden floors. So it is said. It wouldn't be until nearly seven tenths Weeks later, when an early morning raid by police and a SWAT team thousands of miles away from the scene of this crime finally arrested a suspect, Brian Koberger, a 28-year-old doctor doctoral student in the Criminal Justice and Criminology Department at Washington State University. And he was pulled from his parents' home in the rural Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania. And he was charged 
with four counts of first degree murder and one count of federal, <laughs> sorry, felony burglary. But even with this arrest, the mysteries remain. There's neither reasons nor motives. <laughs> Nothing's been revealed that's going to explain to us the horror that those four students endured the final night of their lives. And in that unhealed aftermath, there still remains an arm, army or armory of fears, you guys. 25,000 people in a once seemingly picturesque town nestled into that rolling snow-swept Idaho hill, still alert with suspicions. Neighbors are seared by this mystery of four perplexing deaths. And victims who have left themselves victimized. And later, you know, when it became necessary to be affix blame for the initial confusion over the gravity of the situation, fingers in the Moscow Police Department pointed to the dispatcher. But the truth is that the dispatcher was simply following procedure. All the town's 911 calls are routinely routed to Pullman about 10 miles west in Washington State, which is the home to Washington State University. And they're, there they are handled by the civilian employees of a municipal agency called the Whitcomb 911. These calls come in from... Um, the local Whitman and Estony, um, Asotin counties, as well as the city of <clears throat> Moscow, two universities with a total of about 42,000 students and 70 additional municipal and county agencies. Josh, thank you so much for your contribution. You are so kind and thank you very much. I appreciate you. And thank you. You know, as the dispatch crews, local newspapers and reporters, they're all severely understaffed. Um, the newspaper reports about the, this dispatch center. <clears throat> the overtime schedules often add up to a grueling 20 hours each week. Um, in fact, the Dispatchers Guild has complained that their ability to uphold um, public safety is at risk. And things only get worse on football weekends. So therefore, when callers are agitated rather than risk injurious delays by probing for details, the responders swiftly assign a generic explanation. Unconscious person is one of the standard catchphrases that they use. And it can mean precisely what it says, or it can be shorthand for something more ominous. It was 1158, you guys, on Sunday, November 13th of 2022, 1158 a.m., when the notification of an unconscious person at a residence on 1122 King Road, Moscow, was passed on to Sergeant Shane Gunderson. Now, Shane Gunderson, who on that day was midway through a 12-hour shift that had started at 6 a.m., was running the operations division at the Sparkling Modernistic. And it had opened barely 11 months earlier. South Avenue Police Headquarters. 
So they have a new police headquarters in Moscow. Prior to that moment, he would tell people that his tour had been long and slow and the weekend was just quiet. He said the morning punctuated by the chimes of the town's church bells um, tolling solemnly in the wind. In fact, he had spent a good deal of of that day desk bound, mulling something other than police business. So he had been avidly mapping out in his mind a strategy for the eight hour or more trek that he was going to make to the summit of Mount Bora. And he and a friend from the University of Idaho psych department had been planning this trip for the spring. It's Idaho's highest point, and the trail up the southwest ridge to the 12,662-foot summit is a steep, hard climb. And he'd admit, after a beer or two, it was just the sort of challenge that he had been missing lately. And now that he had his sergeant stripes, police work was more about distributing memos and filing papers than getting out into the field. And that bothered him. He's been on the force nearly 10 years, and he still wanted to be that gung-ho officer who had joined up straight out of the Lewis Clark State College in nearby Lewiston and worked his way up from patrolman. And in his early days, he distinguished himself as a hands-on cop, someone out in the streets doing what the Moscow PD calls community policing. Back then, he'd scored a lot of points both in and out of the department, as well as winning Officer of the Year in 2017, when he single-handedly planned and organized a hot dog barbecue, bringing together the cops and local school kids. He was from the area growing up in small town potlatch and still smarting from his own childhood run-ins. He knew only too well how hard-ass cops could sour things and make things confrontational. And it was his job, he'd say, with determination, looking out for and working with the citizens of Moscow. When the 911 came in, Gunderson had a corporal and two other officers on duty assist him with patrol. He could have left the response to them. He certainly, he'd tell people with a hint of embarrassment, had no intimidation of or intimidation of something out of the ordinary. That morning, he was simply eager to break the monotony. And as always, he felt strongly it was important for him to get out on the street where people could see him. So he swiftly decided he'd go to the scene as well with his officers. It was a quick quick trip. The roads leading into the university neighborhood that Sunday were as empty as the classrooms on campus. And as soon as Gunderson's black and white cruiser pulled up behind the neat row of cars parked in the driveway, of the austere cantilevered house on King Road, he immediately knew something was very wrong. It was the noise. There wasn't any. Just an eerie, unnatural silence. A cluster of young people, university students presumably, were milling outside the open front door of 1122 like gulls on a beach, he would later say. And yet they were exceptionally quiet. They weren't merely subdued. They seemed stunned, as if drained by a deep and intense shock. When the three mystified officers approached the front door, in the, someone in the crowd said, it would be later shared, muttered a single plaintive word, dead. Gunderson would confess to others that he was unprepared, for the strong smell of blood that rose up into his nostrils the moment he walked inside that home. 
the coroner who had once been in an emergency, who had been once been an emergency room nurse in an earlier stage of life would describe the scene in press interviews as chaos, lots of blood. Few others would even attempt to put into words what they saw. There are moments cops will tell you that are too profound, too unnerving to be experienced in the present. All you can do is to move forward and there will be time later to try and make sense of it all. So procedure takes precedence and it allows a protective membrane to be stretched between the real and the too real. All other thoughts, all other feelings become extraneous. Gunderson and his two officers, largely mute, almost robotic in their movements now, stepped carefully across the blood-streaked wooden floor and proceeded to inspect a crime scene. Wedged against a hill, the house rose up on three distinct levels. <clears throat> From a platform base like an ancient Persian ziggurat, the officers set out to inspect each floor and they moved cautiously, not knowing what they'd find yet. Yet, of course, by now, they knew. The first floor, nevertheless, was a surprise. There were two bedrooms, and when they anxiously entered each one, there was no signs of anything out of the ordinary. Later, they would learn that the two university student occupants, Dylan Mortensen and Bethany Funk, had apparently slept obliviously through the carnage. And it was an explanation that made no sense unless one's life had been informed <clears throat> by the experience of being a college student who'd curled up in bed after a long night of drinking. However, as this staggering day would wear on, Mortensen would reveal more about what had happened that night. She told authorities she had heard crying, opened her bedroom door, and saw a man in black clothes and a mask walking past her. Frozen and in shock, she stood immobile as he headed toward a sliding glass door at the back of the house. And then, inexplicably, she returned to her room and locked her door till the morning. But in the daylight, things turned frantic. Mortensen and Funk first stirred from their beds sometime after 11. They found it impossible to rouse their roommates and called friends for assistance. And then in the torrents of confusion, after these friends arrived, one of their cell phones was used to make the agitated 911 call that resulted in the unconscious person message, which was relayed to Gunderson. The trio of officers, meanwhile, proceed with haste to the second floor. They open the bedroom door to find two dead bodies, a male and a female. The pair was gruesomely drenched in blood, yet both their good-looking faces had oddly been preserved like masks. Even at the probing moment, it was difficult, one of the young officers would later nearly wail, to look at the 20-year-old pair. <clears throat> Ethan Chapin was a triplet from Conway, Washington, whose surviving brother and sister also attend the same university. To look at these two individuals absolutely was devastating for these officers. They made their way to the third floor and things, how could things get possibly worse? Well, they did. In one bedroom lying in a single bed were two women, Madison Mogan and Kaylee Gonsalves. They might have been sisters. They were so similar. 21-year-old Barbie dolls. They were pretty like Barbies. <laughs> they had sculptured features and long cascades of thick blonde hair. Yet laying there in their gruesome death, the officers would report that Kaylee had fought 
like hell for her life. There were lacerations and puncture wounds and it seemed like Maddie's wounds, while no less fatal, appeared to be less feral and more measured. Across the narrow hallway was one final door and the officers pulled it open and at last they discovered a sign of life, a fluffy, caramel-colored dog, which turned out to be Murphy, Kaylee's frisky labradoodle. He was unharmed. There was not even a speck of blood anywhere. And it was a con small consolation to these officers and barely one because they were only beginning the process and only were beginning to process what they had just seen. Those frenzied moments and hours that followed that seemingly interminable Sunday, there's only so much that can be authoritatively reported. Even Gunderson and his team lost track of all their efforts in the hectic swell of events. Gunderson called his boss, Captain Roger Lanier, the head of the 24 Office Operations Division, and he found himself not unexpectedly for a Sunday, sitting down to lunch with his family. And Lanier was a veteran cop, and he had spent nearly 20 years on the force in nearby Lewiston before having been lured six years earlier <clears throat> to Moscow with a captain's rank. And after all his years on the job, he'd become a steady, avuncular presence, a bald-headed, genial cop who never got flustered because he'd tell people he'd seen it all in his day. But Gunderson's report left him unnerved. He says, it took me a second. He recalled a sharp edge even weeks later to the memory. I really had to think about what I had just heard. Four murders in Moscow, Idaho. That is totally out of character. But quickly, Lanier's professionalism took control. He had a thousand questions, and yet he knew the only hope of finding any answers would be to follow the previously established protocols. And dutifully, he gave the orders to set up the perimeter of the crime scene to begin the forensic process of examining the evidence and crime scene and to summon the coroner. It was standard in a major case, and if four homicides wasn't a major case, what was? to alert the Idaho State Police, and he did that too. Moscow was the responsibility of the state's District 2 detective office in Lewiston, the county seat, and where he'd been on the job for two, two decades, and he knew many of these state detectives. There was a companionship, but still, it was a very difficult conversation for him to have. His next call was even harder. The university needed to be informed, and it was not just that four students had been brutally murdered in an off-campus home, but there was no way of knowing whether the killer or killers planned to strike again, and the students needed to be warned. At 2.07 p.m., a little over two hours after the three cops had entered the blood-soaked house, the University Office of Public Safety and Security sent a vandal alert email to the students and faculty of the University of Idaho. Moscow PD investigating a homicide on King Road near campus. Suspect is not known at this time. Stay away from the altar area and shelter in place. A shelter in place order requires people to take refuge in a room with no or few windows. And at this point, busy hours had already quickly flown by. But despite his marathon of activities, Lanier still had not succeeded in completing one task that was at the top of his mental list. He had not been able to speak with his boss, James Fry, the chief of police. <clears throat> the chief had been getting death threats. He'd counted six, a viral, a virulent collection of unsigned letters and barking phone messages 
emphatically promising he'd be killed. And those missives were in addition to the tall pile of rude and scatological, although less murderous, emails and notes that he'd received. The reason for these threats? He had ordered his officers to enforce the mayor's and the city council's coronavirus restrictions. People had received summonses for not wearing masks in public, and at a defiantly maskless prayer vigil in the city hall parking lot, several of the more reverent in the open-air assembly had been cuffed and hauled off on Fry's orders. His no-nonsense policing had made the chief a lot of enemies. The municipal restrictions ran counter to the deep-seated, self-reliant pioneer spirit of many Idahoans, and no less a force of enmity in the town. There was a very active and rapidly growing archly fundamentalist congregation at Pastor Doug Wilson's Christ Church, which not only saw masks and vaccinations as counter to God's teachings, but also held that our local city government law enforcement included as a nest of incompetence and corruption. But by the fateful November weekend, when the murders occurred, Chief Fry had hoped that all the bad feelings that had been simmering in this town over the past two years had with the end of the coronavirus restrictions also largely slipped away. The previous spring, he had missed his chance to go on a prolonged elk hunt, and he hadn't felt right about leaving Moscow for too long, but he had no longer such qualms. And on November 12th, Fry and his wife, Julie, had driven to visit a friend nearly three hours away. And by the time Lanier had finally reached him, <clears throat> it was hours after the discovery of the bodies. And by the time Fry finally entered the home on King Road, it was dark outside. And according to several accounts, close to 6 p.m. And for some atrocious reason, he thought it was important to go home first and change into his chief's uniform. Perhaps he hadn't fully grasped the magnitude of this disaster, or maybe after nearly 28 years as a Moscow cop, he had felt the primature of his uniform was integral to his ability to command. But what he saw that evening left him he would confide to friends, physically and emotionally drained. He was a father of two daughters who had attended the University of Idaho, and he had also graduated himself from the university nearly three decades earlier, and it was impossible, he said, not to feel visceral and a visceral tie to the victims and to their parents. The cruelty, the cruelty of this crime was deep, and affecting, and yet he knew there was police work to be done, and his mind was racing, but perhaps within moments, a buried memory pushed itself forward. There was no way of knowing whether the killer or killers planned to strike again, and we need to protect the students. Three years earlier, Fry had been chosen to attend the 10-week course at the FBI's National Training Academy in Quantico, Virginia. He was on the cusp of turning 50, and the impending milestone he'd confided to a close friend had triggered a soul-searching. He wanted to prove that even as he was acknowledging the in inevitability of his soon becoming a senior citizen, he was still the sort of cop who could break up a bar fight or strap on SWAT gear when some local went berserk and started shooting up the courthouse. A chief goes to lunches at the Chamber of Commerce and plays golf with the mayor. Fry wanted to show he could still do more. His friends called him old school, and it was an appraisal that had always sat well with him. So it had been very important to Fry to complete the 6.1-mile obstacle course at Quantico called the Yellow Brick Road, the signs nailed to the tree at the starting line read hurt, agony, and pain. There was climbing over walls, crawling under barbed wire, sloshing through streams, hauling up steep cliffs, and running full speed through rocky and wind winding trails. And Fry did it. 
The certificate he received in recognition of this accomplishment is displayed with pride across from his desk in his headquarters. And it was the what he first talked about when he talked about his time with the F FBI. But on this unsettling evening, another memory reached out to him. A day or so before he'd taken on the Yellow Brick Road, he had been to a class led by a member of the FBI Behavioral Science Unit. The lecturer had explained how the Bureau had been able to get into the heads of killers. They had studied what made them kill and how to catch them before they would kill again. What if Fry asked himself with a sudden alarm a serial killer had attacked the four students? Fry called the Bureau and asked for their assistance. It was quickly arranged and a team of agents, eventually about 40 in total, would be dispatched to Moscow. <clears throat> a smaller group flying in from the Salt Lake City office would be arriving as soon as tomorrow. And as he'd specifically requested three members of the behavioral analysis unit, two men and two women were also dispatched. And Fry wasn't done. He had been working restlessly through the night, but with the dawn of the new day, he realized there was something he'd forgotten. When Rand Walker got the call, he was in his GMC pickup heading down the twisting 700-foot driveway that led from his house to the main road in town. And he looked at the caller ID and figured he knew why the chief was calling first thing in the morning. His friend wanted to apologize. A week or so earlier, Walker, along with his band, had been playing at the Bucer's Coffee House and Pub downtown, and they'd performed 70s cover songs, a lot of Eagles, a lot of Van Morrison, and their version of Neil Diamond's Sweet Caroline was a get-out-of-your-seat favorite. And they had a, quite a following in northern Idaho, and the chief had promised to be there, only he'd never shown. No problem, Chief Walker began breezily. I know you've got plenty to do. You'll catch us next time. It's something else, Fry said curtly. I need you to stand by. Immediately, Walker knew something was wrong and that something must have awful happened. A PhD with a private practice in Moscow, he also served as the department's psychologist. Some of my young officers are going to need your help, Fry continued, and then he corrected himself. Actually, it's not just going to be the young ones. Fry would later say that the wolf had gotten away. <clears throat> so... Nearly every morning at 7 a.m. in the weeks following these murders, Payne would be up at the front of the conference room in police headquarters leading the case briefings. The room was big, filled with rows of polished blonde wood tables sitting on gray pattern carpet. Ceiling lights kept things very bright, and there was a band of small rectangular windows running in a row near the top of a sidewall that let in light, too. Everything looked brand new and very corporate, as if mid-level insurance company had just moved in. But there was a murder board up front with rows of gory homicide photos, and everyone in the room had a gun. The conferences would begin with a recitation of what the investigators knew. It was not a long list. Consider this. Fact. The four students were killed in their sleep sometime between 3 and 5 a.m., in the weeks ahead, they developed a more precise timeline, and the murders the authorities deduced occurred between 4 and 4.25 a.m. Fact, there was no sign of forced entry or of robbery. Fact, a single weapon had been used, a long-bladed knife, and a tan leather knife sheath stamped with the U.S. Marine Corps insignia was found lying next to Maddie Mogan's bed. Fact, there was no trail of blood outside the house. Fact, the house was a repository for a large collection of forensic evidence, blood, saliva, hair, fingerprints, DNA. But whether any of these belonged to the killer after the autopsies, 
autopsies, the general consensus held that it was a single assailant, still was undetermined. These were all, the investigators agreed, important pieces in this puzzle, yet they were not enough. And for more than three weeks, the early morning conferences ended in a grim litany of what remained unknown. And they couldn't figure out how the killer had gotten away seemingly without leaving a clue. And they had no idea why he would have chosen these victims. Well, I have an idea. And I thought that perhaps tonight I would share it with you. I want to show you a photograph. Hold on a second, you guys. Hope everybody's still hanging in there with me. <clears throat> I want to show this one first. So here's the house. Um, this is the front side of the house and this is the front door. And these are the cars of the deceased. This one here is Matt, um, Kaylee's new car. <clears throat> and then there's another car over here on the side. So this is the house. This is where this all took place. Um, hang on a second. And now it brings us to this, to this photograph. This is the back side of the house. This is actually the second floor here. And this is the third floor. This house is very strange the way it's broken up. And I'm sure <clears throat> many of you have seen the inside of it um, on, on some of the um, other channels. Gray Hughes has got a really good um, diagram of this house from the inside. And there's been a couple videos put out of the crime flow <clears throat> based upon the probable cause affidavit um, of that scene. My theory is that when Brian Koberger went to this house that night, his intention was not to kill four people. I think it's quite probable that he had targeted one person in this house. And I could be completely off, but just hear me out. I do believe that he parked back here farther to this direction and was looking, be able to look through the trees and see the backside of this house. And I think he parked there and walked through here and got to this part of the house. There is a chair here and a couch. And I think he stepped on this chair and pulled himself up to the third floor slider balcony area and came through the third floor slider. I think he came in there. Because I think his target was here in this third floor. And much to my disagreement with everyone, I do not believe that it was Kaylee. I believe it was Maddie. There, it, look, it seems to be a screen, but I don't know if this is something that was on the ground, Maria, from law enforcement or if... If that was there from before, I think it goes to this little tiny window right here, which I believe is the kitchen. So I think that that's what that's from. <clears throat> I, 
I think he came through this window. I think he was looking for Maddie. I think he was expecting Maddie to be there. And I think that what happened, he didn't expect Kaylee to be there because Kaylee had already graduated, you guys. Kaylee was already moved out of this house. She only came back that weekend because she wanted to attend a party and she wanted to um, show Maddie her new car. And I don't think that he knew that she was there. And I think when he got into that room, his whole fantasy of what he wanted and what he expected was going to happen that night exploded. And I think that he grabbed Maddie, possibly not even paying attention to seeing Kaylee. And he grabbed her, attacked her, killed her. Kaylee woke up and a fight ensued. And I think that that is why there, there was so many defensive wounds and that she was fighting so hard for her life is because she realized what was happening, obviously, to her friend. Um, and, and he ended her life. And here he is in these two rooms. And we know um, that he stalked these girls and he stalked these ho this house over months and weeks before he ever came to this house. It's in the probable cause affidavit. Um, and that he'd been there late at night in the middle of the night. And so I believe from his vantage points, he was able to see what was going on. He knew the comings and goings of this house. Um, he pretty much knew when they worked, when they didn't work, he would know who was going to be home, um, and who wasn't. I do not expect or think for one minute that he thought Ethan was in this house. Although he may have known that, but assumed that Ethan was asleep. Either or. He leaves the third floor and goes down to the second floor and encounters Ethan. Now, either Ethan went to pick up the DoorDash order or he was getting ready to leave to go back to his dorm because Ethan was not allowed to stay out at night, <clears throat> overnight, he was a freshman in a fraternity. And so he left. He was on his way out is what I'm assuming. He and the perpetrator, Brian, as the police have now told us, I believe that he encountered him there and chased him down the hallway back towards Zana's bedroom because I think Ethan probably saw him with the knife. They, he saw how bloody he was and he wanted to protect her. His first thought was, my God, I need to protect her. And so he goes back there and the, the fight between them ensues. And of course, he ends up killing Ethan right there in front of Zana. And she's in shock. Um, you can't even imagine what that seeing that would do to you. And I believe that she was completely and absolutely just in shock. She wasn't able to scream. She wasn't able to do anything, but possibly what um, Dylan said, she heard her crying um, and he proceeded to kill her. And at that point he had exerted so much um to, to do these four crimes. He didn't plan. He knew that everything he had planned had completely exploded and blown up and he had needed to get it out, get out of there. He needed to hightail it out of there. And, um, so, and he exits quickly. He goes right past Dylan and gets the, the heck out of Dodge and, and, and leaves. <clears throat> Um, so that's kind of how I think this went down. And I don't, 
I honest to God really don't think that he went there with the intentions of killing four people, but I could be absolutely wrong. You guys, and, um, you know, take it with a grain of salt. It's just something that, that I've thought of. Um, hang on a second. Cause I have another, I have another picture here. Um, this picture shows another side of the house, just a different one, a different view of it. And you can see the fraternities because they were right across the street, the back side. And this is um, Nez Pierce Drive over here along here. And that's where all the fraternity row is at. <clears throat> so. When you look at these pictures and you look at these photographs, it, it it just gives you this eerie sense of there's so many people close by. There's so many houses that butt up against this property. And we do know that sounds were heard and things were heard. That's in the probable uh, cause affidavit. Um, I thought this picture here is so sad. It's like a haunting image of where their four cars sat. And this is what it looked like after they towed them away. It's just a haunting image. So Brian leaves <clears throat> the crime scene and this is how he drives. He, he, instead of driving this way straight into Pullman, which is a 10 mile drive, he drives this way guys, all the way down here and all the way back up here. Why? Um, you know, it's, it's like, why? There was a reason for that. What a great picture of the four of them. We'll always remember their smiles and their, and their beauty and their, and their just enjoyment of life. These four kids were enjoying life. Um, <clears throat> this is a picture of a similar K-Bar USMC knife sheath. Um, and this is the knife sheath that was found at the murder scene. And so this was, um, this was what was left behind by Brian in the tense moment um, between Maddie and, and, and Kaylee. And I think that he, things got so out of hand in that, in that first bedroom. Um, he had no idea until later that he didn't have this with him. <clears throat> Again, four wonderful friends just having a gay old time. This was taken, this photo was taken the, um, Hours, just hours before they, they lost their lives. <clears throat> and it's very sad to see that. And then we have this picture. So... What's going on in chat, guys? 
Yeah, of course, Lynn, he could have. He could have hidden the knife. I think he threw the knife in a river. Um, and I think that's why he drove south. Most definitely that stalking behavior. He was stalking them. The police said he was stalking them. Um, he was stalking and looking for somebody because he kept going back to that house in the middle of the night and watching it and spending time there. And I think he was, he was planning and, and watching and learning behavior and patterns of what was happening and the comings and goings of that house. <clears throat> I disagree with this. Um, I'm sorry, I disagree with that. Um, I think that he was, police have said he is, he was stalking. He was stalking someone in that house. Um, and I definitely, like I said, I definitely feel that there was a plan. Um, I think that he, <laughs> that he came there prepared to do what he, what he had fantasized about doing and unfortunately things went downhill rapidly because he did not plan for for what happened and honestly Kaylee was the surprise um she wasn't supposed to be there he knew that she had already moved out of that house he'd been watching them he'd been watching the house and he probably didn't recognize her car because it was a brand new car and he didn't know who that car belonged to. And he was assuming that Maddie was alone. So, um, I mean, anybody in that house could have been his target. We don't know. All of that will come out. Um, eventually for sure. <clears throat> um, there was an article, um, that came out in the independent, um, this week and <laughs> they're saying that <laughs> Brian Koberger slipped past surveillance teams during the Idaho student murder investigation and basically what it says that the investigators that were working on his case lost him for several hours during his cross country trip from his apartment at WSU to his family's home in Pennsylvania. And it has that it has been revealed. Um, yes, it would be stalking behavior. Most definitely. I don't care how many times you're doing it. If you're watching people and they don't know that you're watching them, <laughs> you're stalking them. <laughs> um. Okay, hold on a second. Let's go find out.
Hang on, guys. I'm just getting something. I'm grabbing something to put in chat. So I don't know if you can even see it because. Okay, so what constitutes the crime of stalking? Anyone who willfully, maliciously, and repeatedly follows or harasses another person and makes a credible threat with the intent to place them in reasonable fear for their safety or the safety of their immediate family is guilty of the crime of stalking. And both Zana and Kaylee had said someone was following them and that they both felt stalked. <laughs> so we know someone was watching. <clears throat> um, yes, SSS, you can stalk someone without physically being there. You can stalk people on the internet. You can stalk and harass people in multiple ways nowadays because of technology. You can use social media to do it. You can do it by text messaging. Um, you can do it by um, mail, um, whether it be, um, you know, sending them letters, um, putting things in their mailbox, um, leaving things on their porch that are unwanted gifts. Um, I mean, all of that is, is stalking behavior, especially when it's unwanted. Um, if you most often, I don't really, <clears throat> hold on one second here. I was looking for something else. Um, so anyway, let's get back to what I was talking about. Um, for those of us that um, know what stalking behavior is, um, surveillance teams were tasked with keeping eyes on this 28-year-old crim criminology PhD student after he became the person of interest in the 13th of November murders. But on December 13th, when he began his journey home for the holidays with his father, FBI agents managed to lose him almost as soon as their car pulled out of the parking lot at his graduate housing. The shocking revelation has come to light <clears throat> from sources from law enforcement who admit that for several alarming hours or more, the man believed to have brutally stabbed four University of Idaho students to death had seemingly vanished. Hours later, the car finally pinged miles away in Colorado and surveillance resumed. Mr. Koberger was arrested on December 30th at his family's home and is now behind bars in Moscow. Um, so, the legal team in um, Brian's case, his legal team, has received thousands of documents and photos as evidence in this case. Um, and so, they are getting the discovery, just so you guys know. Um, Court filings reveal that the prosecutors in Moscow handed over the huge trove of evidence to lawyers for the 28-year-old um, last week, including 995 pages of documents, one audio and video file, and, and 1,865 photos. The evidence which shows what led investigators to arrest him for the murders of Kaylee Madison, Zana, and Ethan came in response to the defense's discovery request in the case. However, the state has objected to handing over some information in the case, including the identity of potential informants. Um, the state has objected to requests by the defense for anything not otherwise addressed above on the grounds that such requests are outside the scope of Idaho um, criminal 
um, law ICR 16 and or not subject to disclosure under ICR 16. Prosecutor wrote in the court filings. Um, Zanner, Zanner Kernodal's mother says Brian's lawyer had power of attorney over her and she feels betrayed because um, she gave up her power of attorney um, so that she could represent um, Brian. So she said she's very upset that this happened. Um, Ann Taylor, the chief of the Kootenai Public Defender's Office, filed on January 5th to recuse herself from representing Zanna Kernodal's mother, Kara Denise Northington, in order to become the lead defense attorney for Brian. In an interview with News Nation on Wednesday night, Miss Northington spoke out over the sense of betrayal that she feels after her attorney stepped down from her case, saying she had given Miss Taylor um, power of attorney over her. And Ann Taylor, who once represented Slane University of Idaho student Zanna Kernodal's mother, is now representing Brian Koberger. You have to admit that that is pretty weird. Um, Ethan Chapin's mother has come out and shared how the family is adjusting to new normal after Idaho murders. In a Facebook post on Monday, um, Stacy Chapin said she and her husband had visited her two surviving triplets, Maisie and Hunter, at the University of Idaho over the past weekend. And the Chapin triplets were all enrolled at the college in town, in the town of Motsko, um, when Ethan was killed on November 13th. So... What do we know about the items that may or may not have been seized from Brian um, Koberger's home? The Independent spoke to two experts, Dr. Monte Miller, a former crime scene investigator and forensic expert for the, for the Texas Department of Public Safety, and former FBI agent, um, and a former FBI agent, for their takes on each of the items seized from Brian's home. And, um, and they said that there was probably a trove of evidence that was removed, his computers, and they did um, take out um, something to do with his um, vacuum cleaner. <laughs> he, they took all that stuff as well. They're looking for trace evidence. They're looking for um all kinds of evidence that he could have brought home with him from that crime scene that he wouldn't even have known that he had with him. Um, so I just want to say that, you know, while we as true crime followers, um, you know, I hate to say, that were obsessed, but I, I, I will say that America has long been fascinated with true crime. Um, the shocking brutality of this case, the seemingly randomness of it, um, it sent the internet sleuth communities into overdrive. Um, and it does every time there's a case like this. Conspiracy theories and rumors have dominated the investigation into this case. Thousands of people joining social media groups to discuss their take on what transpired and why. Um, we know that many people were thrown under the bus before Brian was arrested, um, including Kaylee's ex-boyfriend, a, a number of people. I mean, they just had them themselves run, you know, there's, it's still going on. There's still people out there that don't believe Brian is, is the one. Um, and even though he's in custody and that 
huge document that we all saw of probable cause, the online rumor mill is showing no signs of winding down. Um, and there was something that came out a few hours ago, I think about eight hours ago, Zana's mother has come out and said that she opposes the death penalty for Brian. Um, she told News Nation she wants the suspect to pay for what he's done but she is against the death penalty. She said, it's not who she is. I don't believe in the death penalty, but I do think he should spend the rest of his day in jail, days in jail. Um, her stance comes in opposition to the parents of Kaylee, who previously said they would support the death penalty in this case. Um, and they will stay stad um, steadfast. So, um, We know the things, the items that were seized from Brian's home was a nitrite type black glove, a Walmart receipt with a Dickies um, tag, two Marshall's receipts, one dust container from his vacuum, multiple possible hair strands, um, one possible animal hair strand, two cuttings from encased pillows of reddish brown stains, two top and bottom mattress covers with multiple stains, items with a dark red spot, um, a computer tower, a fire TV stick. I still say that those mattress covers he could have used on his seats in his car to sit on. Um, I, I, I just think he would have been prepared that way. Um, so... Uh, that's what we know. We also know that, that Brian um, applied in the spring of April of 2022 for an, a research assistantship for public safety with the um, Pullman uh, Police Department. And we don't know if he was a final candidate or where that was. Um, but we do know that he um, had also done that. So there's a lot with this case. Um, there's going to be a lot to follow in the weeks and months to come. Um, it'll be. Interesting to see what happens um, as this case makes its way into the court system. I've had a lot of people email me and ask me my thoughts on if um, he will um, plead or admit to this. I know I do not see this person ever admitting to this crime. Um, so no, I don't see that happening. Um, I know that there's um, there was an FBI agent and I can't I wish I could remember her name um, that did an interview with Newsweek and she was talking about how much energy needs to be um, exerted when you murder four people by hand um, in basic hand to hand combat with a knife and she she felt that fatigue played a role in why he left the house um i i think it's i think that's part of it but i also think it's because his entire plan was thwarted it is not what he expected it's not what he wanted to have happen um so that's my take on it um um And I do believe that he could very well have been in such an, a, a, a heightened state of frenzy after the Zana and Ethan murders that he was literally almost trance-like as he walked past Dylan in that hallway um, and he didn't even see her.
I mean, he, he just didn't even see her. Um, I think it's interesting that he came back to the house in the morning hours, but I do think that that's because he wanted to see what was happening. He couldn't believe he, it wasn't on the radio yet. There was no um, announcement of a, a quadruple homicide in um, Moscow. And he, I can guarantee you he was listening for that. Um, he may even have had um, a police scanner app on his phone where he could um, try to get that information, but he wanted to know what was going on. Now, whether or not he would have come back to try to get his, his sheath that he dropped, I doubt it because um, I think he was more apt to wanting to see what was going, going, going on in the, in the area with, with the police. <clears throat> It would have been a really risky for him to go back in that house and try to recover any evidence. Um, so, and again, I just want to say, you know, uh, to everybody out there, for everybody who continues to uh, talk badly about Dylan and why she reacted the way she did and why it took her so long to call uh, the police and 911. It's really easy to be an armchair quarterback on Monday morning and, and sit and talk about all the things that you would have done differently. You have no idea what you would have done in that situation. Um, you don't have a clue the trauma and the utter sheer fear and, and terror that could be going on in your mind. Um, and you can't put yourself in these kinds of situations. You can try to and think about it, but it is not the same as being there. Um, I don't believe for one minute that Dylan thought that all four of her friends had just perished in that house. I don't think she thought that. And I think she went back to bed. Um, <clears throat> so... I just, that's just my, my feet, my thought, you guys, on what I, on how I feel. Uh, I, I think it's very, like I said, I think it's very interesting. Um, as time goes on, we will know more. I was happy to see that the um, discoveries happening and they're getting that um, to the defense um, that's always a good sign. So. I don't know what you're talking about. Lazy thinking. What? Can you expect, explain that to me? Yeah, I, I feel that there's some, there's a lot of things going on. I just don't know what, what's happening in the chat. Keep it respectful. Um, I don't allow um, people to be talked down to or to people to be talked badly to. So that doesn't happen here in my chat. So. Just consider that a, a, a warning. <clears throat> so, um, anyway, that was basically um, what I wanted to cover as far as the case tonight. Um, I did want to say um, with the Delphi case, um, hold on a second. I need to 
pull something up because we didn't really go there. Um, today, there was a petition uh, to let to bail that the state responded to. Um, and basically it said, now comes the state of Indiana by prosecuting attorney Nicholas C. McClelland um, and respectfully files its response to the defendant's petition to let to bail and would ask the court to deny the same. The state of Indiana would ask the court to not set bail or to release the defendant on his own recognizance and would ask the court to continue to hold the defendant without bond. In support, the following request, the state shows the following, that charges were filed against the defendant, Richard Allen, on October the 28th, 2022, for two counts of murder, in violation of Indiana Code 35-42-1-1, with two in parentheses. That at the initial hearing held on October 28, 2022, the state of Indiana asked that the defendant be held without bail, and the court ordered that the defendant is to be held without bail. That the defendant filed a petition to let bail on December, or excuse me, on November 21st, 2022, stating that the proof of guilt is not evident nor is the presumption of guilt strong that the defendant is guilty of murder. That the defense is asking that the defendant be released on his own recognizance or that a reasonable bail be set. Number five, that the per the Carroll County local rules, the defendant is presumed to be held without bond on the offense of murder. The state believes there is competent evidence that the court can rely on and from which the court can make its own independent determination that the admissible evidence against the accused adds up to strong and evident proof <clears throat> of murder for which bail may be wholly denied. Number eight, that the state believes this evidence shows a preponderance of the evidence that the defendant committed the crimes of murder. Number nine, under Indiana Code 35-33-8-2, the crime of murder is not bailable if the state proves by a preponderance of the evidence that the proof is evident or the presumption strong that the defendant committed this offense. Wherefore, now comes the state of Indiana by prosecuting attorney Nicholas C. McClelland and files their response to the defendant's petition and asks the court to deny the request, find that the state has met its burden, and to hold the defendant without bail until a trial can be held on this matter and for all other just and proper relief in the premises. And um, that was what was um, filed with the courts today in the case of Delphi. So we knew this was coming. Um, it was, it's the reason that they're having the bail hearing on February 17th for Richard Allen. Um, so we knew that the, the, at some point the prosecution was going to put in something, you know, they were going to file something with the court. So the court's aware that they still do not believe that this um, suspect um, defendant needs, needs to be out on bail. And like they said, with the preponderance of their evidence, um, there is no bail in the state of Indiana for murder. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that it's not, he's not going to get it, but um, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, <clears throat> Let's see.
let's see. So, <clears throat> anyway, um, a lot's been going on. Um, and so I've got a couple things that I'm going to end my show with tonight. And, and be done with it. Um, I thought I was done with this, um, way, way last year, but obviously, um, Hey, Mitzi Scott, thank you so much. Um, so glad that you were here. Um, for those of you that are not aware, there has been a bunch of horrible things being um, said about True Crime Maria, myself included, by another content creator, and I am not going to even go there. And speak his name. But those of you that are aware. And those of you who are watching my chat. Um, and not speaking. That follow this individual. I just want to let you guys know. That any of you who condone. What this person is doing. Or has done. Um, not only to, to Maria and myself. But anyone else. Um, that they continue to harass and bully and um, threaten, at, um, blackmail, they can absolutely not partake in my uh, chats or, or my live streams because I'm not going to stand for that kind of behavior in my channel. Thanks, Josh. I'm so glad that you don't know about it. Stay out of it. It's drama and you do not want any of it. Um, true crime and why I started my channel means too much to me. I've put too much time and effort into growing this channel and to making people aware of these cases. And we have so much work to do. And um, I, I love the, uh, <clears throat> and I love the, the direction in which we're headed this year. And I'm not, all of this stuff is behind me. I'm not going to engage with this person. So I'm not going to, um, I, I'm just not. And I just want everyone to know, you all know who I am. You follow me enough. You've watched me. You've listened to me for well over a year. I am the real deal. I am an honest person. I don't play games. I'm not here to hurt people. And I'm not here to, um, you know, do anything but share the stories for the, for the people who have no voices anymore. And who really, truly need our help. There is so much energy in, in this um, online world um, put to, to no good. I don't understand how people have all this time in the world to sit behind keyboards and harass, stalk, and hurt others. I don't understand it. I never will. Um, it, it's it's beyond me. It's ridiculous. And for them to sit and say that they want to let it go, well, then let the let it go. If that's the truth, then stop making videos about it and stop talking about it and stop and stop behaving like a child. <clears throat> I doubt that that will ever happen because I do believe this person has got serious mental um, health issues and needs some serious mental health help. 
But that's all I wanted to say on the subject. And I'm sorry for those of you that don't know what's going on. Count yourself lucky. For those of you that do, you know where I stand on it. Um, I am HCC um, has been part has been pulled into this. There's there's just so many out there, so many other creators that have been pulled into this person's nightmare and it just has to stop. So with that being said, you guys, I hope you enjoyed um, the time with me tonight and the, the story that and how I recounted the Idaho murders to you. There is a <clears throat> um, airmail article that um, has a lot of good information. I'm going to post it in the description. If you guys want to go look that up and, and read about it, it's a, it's, there's some really good information there. Um, and it's, I don't know. It, it, like I said, this case is heartbreaking. Um, it's, it's, I think it just makes us all wonder why. Um, and I don't know that even if we ever get told why, it, any of it will make sense to us. And I feel like um, I was talking to Maria about this um, earlier this week, but we were talking about cases and how some cases just blow up and the communities get super large and it seems like crazy people get pulled into those communities. And um, man, Idaho's no different than Delphi, although Delphi's probably worse. Um, and I know people say that uh, there are other cases out there that are equally as bad, but <clears throat> I I don't get into those communities. I'm not a person who engages on Discord. I have a private Discord for my channel, my subscribers, um, my paying members are actually who get to go into my Discord. Um, other than that, I really don't have a, a strong presence on social media except for uh, except for Twitter. Um, and I do share my 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 channel there. Um, I did start the Abby and Libby um, Delphi's Delphi's daughters <laughs> subreddit before I came to YouTube. Um, and that's how I get started in all this. But you guys know all that. And, you know, these cases are tough. It takes content creators take a lot of their time. And, um, you know, those of us that dig deep and, and do the work, try to uh, find as much as we can factual information on these cases to share with you so that we can have competent discussions. It's really, really important I've always said how we tell their story matters. And it's about every single case we cover. It doesn't matter which case. Every single one matters. Um, so, yeah, I love you guys. Have a good evening. I will see you all um, on Thursday. And um, be safe out there. And please be kind to everyone. Good night, you guys. Have a good evening.